Hello and welcome everyone. We are now starting our first official unit in the class, Prehistory from Paleolithic to Neolithic to the Doorstep of Civilization, to make it dramatic. So we have some terms to define here. First, prehistory. What the heck does that mean? Since the dictionary generic definition of history is the past, and prehistory then would mean before the past. That's quite a mind bender. And fortunately, that's not what we're saying. Uh, whew, uh, I dodged a bullet there. But uh, we're looking at the more specific definition of history, and that's the study of history, which we're doing here. Uh, and what do historians study primarily to know anything at all about the past? Written records of the past. Primary source documents, which we're becoming acquainted with uh, in this class already. So uh, prehistory then refers to the long time period uh, in the human past, spanning million, a couple million years if you go back to early hominids, but uh, our species maybe a hundred thousand years ago to several thousand years ago before there were any written uh, records at all because there was no writing. Spoken language uh, uh, did spring up during that time, but written language uh, comes much later. So this is a long time period in which if we want to know something and study uh, it, uh, as we do, we must uh, rely on something other than written records. And primarily what we rely on are artifacts. Archaeologists uh, primarily study artifacts, stuff uh, uh, taken out of the ground, uh, stuff from the past, animal, human remains, uh, stone, uh, uh, weapons, uh, clay, uh, shards of pottery, uh, and on and on and on. So uh, by digging up such stuff, archaeologists and other uh, scholars in related fields uh, can actually put together a remarkable amount of knowledge, uh, sometimes detailed knowledge, uh, about uh, humans uh, that long ago. So it's in this one unit and one unit only that I get to play uh, professional archaeologists for one unit. So uh, again, uh, historians are trained to study the written record of the past. They do rely on artifacts, archaeology, uh, and other subjects as well, but that's a, a small percentage of what they usually rely on. But here, uh, we don't have a choice because there are no written records. So I get to play archaeologists. So what do these two uh, terms uh, following prehistory mean? Paleolithic, and I can never say it uh, fast without botching it, so I have to slow myself down. And Neolithic, to the doorstep of civilization. Civilization later. The two terms are fancy terms for something that we can call, are called much more simply, Old Stone Age and New Stone Age. In fact, that's what they mean. Uh, but the terms are used in our textbook and uh, you know, by scholars, so we might as well know what they mean. What do we mean by Old Stone Age and New Stone Age? By age, we mean like era, time period. So why is why are these are both periods, eras in history? Why would archaeologists or scholars in general label uh, entire gigantic periods uh, in human history? the old Stone Age and the new Stone Age. What do stones have to do with uh, human history to the point where we make labels uh, out of them? Uh, well, what we found as far as tools are concerned from such peoples uh, is primarily made out of stone. So uh, Paleolithic and Neolithic is a reference to the huge amount of stone tools uh, uh, dug out of the ground uh, from uh, many, many eras, uh, thousands to, again, hundreds of thousands of years ago. The earlier period, Paleolithic, Old Stone Age, uh, spans from around 100 to 200,000 years ago to about uh, 10,000 years ago, or less, depending on what part of the world we're talking about. The Neolithic period covers from about 10 to 5,000 years, actually from about 10 to 5,000 years, but that varies a little bit from uh, uh, you know, region to region, continent to continent. So it's in the latter, as we'll see, Neolithic period that we see a, a major move uh, to agriculture, farming, and the domestication of animals, which uh, very often or usually go together around the same time. So one of the reasons that we sort of change names uh, at some point about 10,000 years ago from Paleolithic or Old Stone Age to Neolithic is because uh, of the revolution of farming. 
sometimes it's referred to as the Neolithic Revolution, which will take us up eventually to the doorstep of civilization. Here uh, on this slide, we don't need to go back millions of years, though I am just briefly, but uh, we see the scale of uh, hominid evolution, uh, human-like evolution uh, throughout uh, its longer history. Our species, uh, Homo sapiens, is uh, of much more recent origin if we go back to the earliest uh, known hominids uh, five to nine million years ago. So uh, just to give us some sense of uh, time here. We're talking about vast amounts of time, obviously, which means that human history itself, the written part of it, uh, is just but a tiny, tiny speck, uh, right, uh, in the sort of the much bigger history, history of uh, humanity. So uh, humans were roaming the earth uh, for, uh, you know, thousands and hominids, millions of years, long before they ever spoke had spoken language or, or uh, you know, even longer before they had written language. We see human, uh, early human migration here. The evidence uh, is uh, overwhelming that human origins uh, are in Africa uh, and that humans spread to other continents from there, which you can see on this map, which might not look like a map to you. I know geography isn't taught very much any longer, and this makes it worse because this is a map uh, it's kind of looking at the globe from above, like looking down from above the North Pole. So Africa's in the lower right, uh, and you can see then the black arrows that roughly correspond to migration patterns out of Africa, pardon the pun, uh, since there was a movie by that name a number of decades ago, not about this. And uh, uh, then peoples moved into, you can see the Middle East, into Europe, into Asia, uh, eventually into the Americas uh, afterwards. So let's we'll start with the Paleolithic period, or Old Stone Age, about 200, I said 250,000 years ago. These are estimates, to about uh, 10,000. BP means before the present. Uh, it's another term that uh, scholars have begun to use sometimes to replace the old BC or BCE. Uh, this is an attempt to simplify, make easier. Whether that's true or not is questionable. I do think this is a a simpler uh, way to look at it because it just means before now. So you count back 10,000 years before the present for now, and that's what they're talking about. However, uh, the problem is that uh, if this is a third way to uh, uh, sort of date uh, events in the past, uh, it just adds a third to the two that were already there. So uh, depending on how you look at it, this is a simplification or a complication. I will try to use it uh, as much as I can. I particularly like the formulation but some sources that I use uh, don't have that, so I uh, rely on them uh, at times. But it doesn't matter uh, when we go this far back in the past. We're looking at you know rough estimates uh, for the most part anyway. Uh, a professor named David Christian, who teaches a kind of a sub-field of history these days, which caught on, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, uh, known as Big History, which looks at the whole uh, span of, of human uh, uh, history, all the way back to the uh, uh, Paleolithic and even before. In fact, big history goes back and looks at uh, the Big Bang, the development of the universe, our solar system, the sun, the earth, and then on to human beings. But we don't need to touch on that. But uh, his books are really interesting. And in one of them, he says, genetically, the earliest human beings were more or less identical to you and me. Their emotional lives were as rich as ours. They were as intelligent as humans today, and they communicated fluently. Yet their lives were, of course, very different. How did our ancestors live during the 250,000 years or so of the Paleolithic era? Though we have no detailed records about particular communities, no precise dates, and of course no names, we have enough evidence to sketch out some very general answers to these important questions, which is what we're about to do. So, I told you that I'm playing professional archaeologist, uh, mimicking one in this unit. And as one archaeologist uh, whose books I like says, uh, archaeologists study shattered bones, chipped stones, and bits of charcoal. So how do we know anything at all about prehistoric peoples? Uh, well, what you see below, other things like it. 
archaeologists uh, going to uh, remote sites, often remote anyway, and digging up stuff. You see skeletal remains there, uh, bone fragments there, pieces of charcoal, arrowheads uh, or spear uh, points, uh, stone tools, left or right, uh, a, a dug, uh, a, a site uh, that's been dug out at the bottom left, and this is the kind of uh, stuff that we have to rely on to know what happened uh, with any degree of accuracy thousands of years ago. I want to take a moment and touch here on ecology and climate in prehistory. We can kind of see uh, uh, climate change uh, over uh, thousands of years. And we do see from the graph that it does fluctuate quite a bit. But I only want to make really one uh, point, I mean one general point, a couple of uh, specifics uh, in, inside. When, and this might seem obvious to those of you that are, uh, I don't know, majors uh, in science or uh, something that is uh, similar to this, uh, but it's not, I think, obvious to most people. In fact, it seems a little bit counterintuitive for most people when you first hear it, read it. When climate warms and gets uh, uh, wetter, and that's the part of what is counterintuitive, uh, warm and wet go together, meaning warm and rainy go together, and cold and dry go together, uh, also counterintuitive. Uh, so uh, when the climate warms and more rainfall comes uh, at the same time along with it, more regions of the world become habitable uh, with more food available. So uh, for all of the uh, you know, downsides to climate change, and we know there are many, uh, I mean, in, in terms of the warming part of it, uh, the upside uh, is that more food uh, became available for such people uh, in the past, which then meant that some of the ecological, some of the uh, even social pressures that come from ecological change and pressures were lightened in those periods because in colder, drier periods uh, where there's less of the earth habitable because with less rainfall and more of the earth's uh, surface under ice or in very, very cold uh, you know, weather, then there are, there are not as many arable regions, not as many places where food uh, is growing uh, because of that weather. Uh, and so less food, let's say, you know, just uh, assuming uh, equal population size, you're likely to have more conflict over food and conflict for survival. Uh, so population also tends to go up in the warmer and wetter periods, which makes perfect sense. Uh, this is a, a common feature of uh, history, uh, that when populations rise, the food supply goes up. Uh, when the food supply goes up, populations rise. Which one of those is causal is not entirely clear, uh, but there's no doubt that there's a, uh, there's a linkage between the two. There's a correlation to be certain. So they're kind of mutually reinforcing. So when, when you see uh, an, a period in the past with warmer uh, and wetter uh, weather, more rainfall, warmer temperatures, uh, more land uh, is uh, you know, uh, habitable, uh, for wild growing edible plants, uh, and you see populations rise. So it does make it sound like everything is just hunky dory uh, in the hotter, uh, wetter periods, and uh, you know, much more dangerous and violent uh, in the colder, drier periods. But not always so. Uh, well, uh, sometimes so, of course, as I already mentioned, more competition. But uh, when populations rise, uh, sometimes uh, a particular group of people a particular part of the world, can reach an ecological ceiling, uh, meaning what was, a, for a time, a, a cornucopia of foodstuffs, uh, with the population, say, doubling over a number of uh, generations, uh, might then all of a sudden be not enough food, uh, assuming that the food supply stayed the same, you know, double the, uh, the people, uh, say 50 years later, now that's not sufficient. Uh, and so you can then see uh, decline, uh, you know, violent conflict, migration, splintering of groups. Uh, one advantage that peoples thousands and thousands of years ago had uh, is that uh, the population of the whole globe uh, was so scant by comparison to our world today that one way of mitigating or avoiding conflict uh, over resources or other things uh, was for one group to say, you know what, we're going to go over here because there was plenty of land available. That's not to say there were never clashes uh, and 
people wanting the same uh, uh, resources, at least temporarily, uh, there were plenty uh, in warmer, wetter, or colder, drier periods. Uh, but uh, uh, compared to today, uh, there was uh, there were far more places to kind of escape to. You could always stand and fight, and that certainly happened. Uh, but you could uh, splinter if a group was divided on sort of what to do, where to go. One might just say, you know, forget it. We're going to avoid this controversy by leaving you guys and moving here, which actually does help to explain uh, some of the uh, uh, migrations uh, and the uh, uh, you know, human feeling of the entire planet uh, in time. So when the climate gets colder and drier, people are often competed uh, more than usual, sometimes violently, over fewer of what archaeologists, believe it or not, actually often refer to as Gardens of Eden remaining. Uh, of course, that's a biblical reference, uh, and they don't mean it they literally, but what they mean is that uh, these are like little oases uh, that were found uh, in parts of the world, right? Uh, if there's uh, barren land all around, and partly because the weather is so cold, uh, there might be, you know, one or five spots, or two spots uh, in a particular region where there is uh, a great deal of food, uh, and uh, there's lots of competition then uh, for control of or access to those spots. So gardens of Eden uh, become uh, you know, places to rely on, but also uh, potential places of great conflict as well. We will have uh, a course to come back to uh, this issue uh, time and time again here. We're talking about hunter-gatherers, uh, by the way. So in the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age, everybody uh, was a hunter-gatherer around the world. Um, you could say that hunting and gathering is the default position for human beings, the entry-level position for humans. It's what they first do. Farming comes later because it's more complicated. It takes uh, acquisition of knowledge and uh, kind of more experimentation in a rough sense. And so hunting and gathering is what everyone did globally uh, for uh, thousands and thousands of years. So how did hunter-gatherers survive? Well, you got it. They hunted and gathered. Uh, uh, most of the time, not always, men uh, doing the hunting. Uh, most of the time, not always, women doing the gathering. Why a sexual division of labor, as it's uh, referred to in scholarly uh, uh, journals and books? Uh, because uh, the, the main reason uh, is that uh, women uh, doing the, of course, childbearing and much of the child rearing uh, were then tied kind of closer to home. Uh, hunting takes uh, people out much further away from the settlement, the encampment, campsite, as it's sometimes called. You can see one here, although this is something closer to a uh, semi-permanent series of dwellings. So uh, men who weren't encumbered, uh, with uh, child-bearing uh, uh, duties uh, uh, could move further afield. Uh, there's also kind of the bigger, stronger element uh, that's in there, but it is the, the children that appear to be the bigger uh, reason. So uh, how did hunter-gatherers survive? Not just uh, uh, what they ate, which of course is hunting wild animals and game and gathering edible um, fruits, nuts, berries, vegetables, roots, tubers, uh, and on and If it was edible, uh, they found it. So, uh, sort of kind of breaking this down, and, and it's remarkably similar, actually, worldwide. I'm not saying there weren't, weren't cultural variations from place to place and continent to continent, but it is amazing how similar uh, all of these uh, Paleolithic cultures were. Uh, so, everything I'm about to say here that's on the screen uh, and not on the screen is pretty much the same everywhere in this uh, you know, big time period that long ago. Usually only uh, two or eight people went out together uh, on a hunt or even on gathering forays. They lived in groups of only 20 to 50. 20 to 50 was the whole society. Uh, although we'll see, they sometimes uh, once or twice a year would meet up with other groups of 20 to 50 uh, and kind of have like a big party. Now, we'll see that there were some other important things that went on there too, but probably all be partly was a party as well. Uh, overall, the basic social unit was the family, uh, uh, which I think doesn't require too much more common. It makes perfect sense. Location appears to have been everything, which also is common sense. The closer to the equator, 
uh, the lower their caloric needs, uh, the nearer uh, the poles, uh, uh, you need it twice as much or twice as many calories. Uh, close to the equator uh, or closer to the equator, uh, the split between vegetable uh, um, calories uh, and animal calories was in favor of plants uh, and you know, uh, gathering. Uh, closer to the poles, things are colder, not as much uh, you know, wild uh, edible uh, plants, uh, not as many around. Uh, then it's the reliance more on animals uh, for the diet. Overall, the phrase or the percentage that I hear thrown around, though again, it's an estimate worldwide, averaged out, is 60 40. Uh, about 60% of the dietary intake was from food gathered uh, mostly by women, and 40% from the uh, hunts uh, and the meat brought uh, in by mostly men, which does mean then that uh, women were more uh, relevant, uh, more important to the survival of the community uh, than men, which appears to be true. Uh, the foraging strategies, uh, and there are many of them, hunting, gathering, strategy, foraging is another term for hunting, gathering, boiled down to basically five and were based on rational, efficient principles. Uh, it's quite amazing, uh, and this is a good a place to uh, make this point uh, for the first time, though I'm surely going to uh, mention it again in other places where we see it. But I think when we first start studying hunter-gatherers thousands of years ago, there's a tendency to greatly underestimate them. Think they weren't as smart as we were, they you know couldn't think like we do, they didn't know, they didn't know very much, etc. Wrong. The hunter-gatherers had to have as much knowledge in their head, for instance, as uh, we do today, if not more. Uh, and one of the reasons should already be obvious, and that is that they didn't have anything to, you know, they couldn't write anything down. So if they're out on a hunt or a gathering foray and they see something that they've never seen before, they couldn't just get out a pen and, uh, you know, jot it down or get out a, a, a tablet and, or, or their you know, smartphone and make a note to themselves. They had to remember it. Uh, how many things are we free not to remember these days because of all of our technological devices? So these people had to be smart, and they had to stuff enormous amounts of knowledge into their heads uh, and be able to uh, keep it and retrieve it in order to survive and thrive. Uh, when I say five foraging strategies, scholars have boiled it down to approximately five. Uh, not that they were all using uh, you know, uh, all five. I don't know of any group that was using all five at once. Usually they were using one, maybe two. But what do we mean by strategies? Again, this is, helps us to understand the complexity uh, of life for hunter-gatherers. It wasn't just uh, uh, sort of stumbling around uh, idiotically, you know, uh, you know, trying to find uh, food, you know, bumbling and stumbling. They knew what they were doing, at least uh, over you know, generations and generations of experience, through that experience. So I, I, I forget, honestly, the, the strategies themselves, the specifics, but all, we don't need the specifics. Uh, what's being said here is that there were multiple uh, strategic kind of devices, in a sense theories, that th these people used. And uh, it would be, uh, it'd be kind of boiled down to the remembered versions, or even uh, just sort of things that become second nature to people, uh, of uh, what we could call today algorithms. So there were formulas, basically, already remembered, uh, passed down from generation to generation, uh, learned through uh, a bitter, sometimes hard, uh, experience uh, on uh, about what you uh, hunt, uh, when you hunt it, uh, what you gather, what you don't gather, as far as uh, you know, food is concerned. So just to take a hypothetical example, if a foraging party is going out from this campsite uh, early in the morning, it is snow on the ground there, so uh, might be more animals. But let's just say it's uh, you know plant life they're looking for, edible plants, and about two miles out, like eight in the morning, they find some berries. Uh, bushes. Uh, they uh, they know they're edible. They've seen them before. So that's part of the algorithm. Uh, but they also know that those particular berries uh, are uh, not very high in uh, calories. Did they know about calories in those days? Well, no, not literally. Uh, but of course, they uh, kn knew uh, by eating uh, different types of food, uh, which gave them more energy and which gave them less. So this would be baked into their, pardon the pun, into their algorithm as well, uh, already, you know, okay, these berries are edible. We found them, you know, within an hour of leaving the camp. We've got a lot of satchels here and bags and baskets to put stuff in. 
we could just pick these and, and, and move on. There's a lot, but uh, they're not very high in calories. Let's also say that berries, for whatever reason, take a, a great deal of preparation. So even when you get them back to the campsite, you can't just eat them immediately. It takes a lot of work. So all of those things are figured in to the calculations, into that particular strategy, whatever it is. Uh, and so the leader, uh, let's say a band of eight that's out uh, foraging, uh, just says, maybe they all know it, but the leader says, no, we're, we're, leaving, we're leaving these. Uh, the reason being, he already knows that the, the, the rule is, you know, let's, again, I'm, I'm making this up. Uh, I'm hypothetically giving you a, an example. But let's say he says, uh, oh, the, the rule is, or he knows, the rule is if you find these berries uh, within the first you know, two hours uh, of foraging, which means you're closer to your campsite, uh, they're not worth picking. Uh, it's better to save your bags and baskets for uh, you know, and time uh, for something that's of higher calories. We're coming back this way anyway. If we get nothing else, then it would make sense to put the berries in as a last resort if we've come up empty-handed uh, or have at least some space in our you know, uh, bags in our baskets at that point. So it, it is amazing when you study it. I never understood this or even thought of it before I first started reading books on this subject. And they're, fasc they're fascinating, but a great deal of thought uh, went into this. But over time, so much thought went into it that sometimes, you know, once the, the knowledge has been built up uh, and passed down through many generations, hundreds and even thousands of years, it then does become like an automatic algorithm. Let's say, let's say the leader is the dude with the bow and arrow, just because he's kind of prominently displayed in the picture. Uh, he knows the second he sees those berries, and they're only like a couple hours uh, into their uh, gathering, or it's the woman, since uh, women did uh, the majority of the gathering. Let's say she's the leader. Either way, they uh, uh, he or she decides, no, 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 uh, the, the rule is we, we move on. Now, not that they always stuck to that. Uh, maybe they're starving hungry. And, uh, you know, uh, the leader or the whole group sort of loses their, uh, you know, uh, ability to uh, you know, think momentarily because everybody's starving and they sort of don't do the rational uh, thing sort of based on uh, hard, uh, you know, hard won rules, uh, right? So some, some of this stuff is learned through the school of hard knocks, making mistakes in the past that uh, you learned, you know, from uh, your father, uh, your parents, you know, grandparents, etc. Hunter gatherers, of course, uh, if you're foraging for food, if you're hunting and gathering, the plants and animals usually aren't nice enough just to stop and stay in one place for you. So you have to move around. So hunter gatherers were nomadic or uh, semi nomadic, as we'll see, there are some variations because they have to chase the food around. And certainly, the animals they have to chase around, chase around, but in a sense, they have to chase the plant uh, life around as well because uh, what's uh, growing uh, or edible, uh, available in one season, in one place, is not always what's available and growing in that same place in the next season. So uh, in a way, they're chasing the animals around uh, as, as well. Through the uh, many, uh, right, the vast amount of archeological digs worldwide that have been done, by now, over 150 years of archaeology, uh, we can see uh, clearly from the uh, archaeological record of tools, in this case, uh, technological advance and development, which I think isn't a surprise. That these people are learning uh, and passing down the knowledge on to the next generation who are then taking that knowledge in without having to do all the trial and error and experiments and mistakes and then sort of uh, making their own experiments and making their own mistakes and furthering knowledge themselves and passing that on to the next generation. And you can see from the record uh, and from the time periods uh, when these tools uh, were uh, you know, made. And by the way, I'm not going to go into it here. I think I have a slide a little bit later on. Even there, I'm not going to go into it a lot. The methods for dating uh, how long ago something uh, you know uh, was made, like uh, stone tools and even uh, uh, biological remains, uh, are remarkable. There are a number of them, uh, but, but they really are uh, pretty accurate. Uh, you'd be surprised. You'd have to kind of read up on that, but uh, you'd be amazed. So they can know then, okay, this, uh, th these tools came from, you know, uh, 50,000 years ago. This group over here came from 30,000 years ago. This came from 12,000 years ago. 
and what you see most of the time is that the, from you know those that remain longest ago to those that were found or made uh, most recently and found uh, there is technological advance. The, school, the tools become more complex, more sophisticated, more complicated, requiring more and more steps uh, to produce uh, and to uh, craft. Oh, it's the next slide. How do we know anything uh, about uh, uh, right, uh, these peoples in the past? Uh, and how do we know when it was in the past? Carbon uh, dating uh, carbon-14 dating uh, is explained sort of in this chart. I'm not going to ask you about that. This is just to, uh, if you're interested or just to show you uh, in a general sense the complexity of all this. But I'm not going to ask you uh, any specifics about carbon-14. Uh, though I might ask you, you know, what it was in, you know, in a general sense. It's a, it's a way to date uh, uh, and on, uh, analyze uh, uh, fossils and artifacts. What really sets human beings apart, meaning from other uh, animals uh, and uh, you know, uh, other you know, living species, the development of language and culture. And first we're talking, of course, about spoken language, probably developed about 100,000 years ago, uh, and written language, as I said, only uh, several thousand years ago. Uh, and each one was an enormous, really technological advance. Uh, and uh, advance uh, in uh, you know, uh, human beings' ability uh, to uh, do many things uh, and add sort of greater complexity uh, uh, to their ability uh, uh, to do things and to know things because you can now write down, remember, uh, refer back to, pass on, uh, or exchange knowledge uh, much more easily. If we fast forward to the present uh, and look at computers, internet, social media, we can see, uh, of course, the ability to communicate efficiently uh, you know, can do uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands uh, of things uh, that all move in the direction of greater uh, complexity, uh, greater ability to kind of uh, manipulate uh, and exchange uh, ideas, language, informa information. So we see that uh, uh, here uh, early on. The knowledge, rules, values passed down uh, through teaching, uh, through stories, through myths. Uh, so uh, it's not just knowledge about how to make tools and uh, you know, uh, hunt uh, animals, uh, but uh, uh, cultural uh, things, uh, culture in a more specific sense, uh, artwork, uh, religion, uh, etc. Uh, Daniel Shiro, in a really good book, professor at, I think, Washington University, if I'm not mistaken, sociologist, says, culture, in the sense used here, refers simply to the store of knowledge uh, any society possesses. This is actually culture in the more general sense, uh, but it's a good definition, I think. It might be considered analogous to the ge genetic code carried in our cells that determines our physical structure. The ideas that make up a culture contain the codes or blueprints according to which societies perform their economic activities, make decisions, and organize their interactions among themselves. Uh, so, uh, in the general sense, then, culture refers to basically a set of rules, uh, codes, blueprints, but sort of rules, values, sometimes uh, uh, passed on or uh, shared through stories, myths, literature, artwork, uh, etc. Et, et Another uh, uh, scholar writing about something similar uh, about language says, in short, through the medium of verbal language, which in effect, in effect means speech, all human beings may participate, uh, uh, partake of all the thoughts of all other human beings through all of time, uh, which is a big statement, but it's of course true uh, that uh, we, even now, especially now, uh, rely on uh, right, previous generations uh, and the accumulation of knowledge over time. Not that all knowledge is cumulative, Sometimes knowledge can prove to be false, and we have to kind of go, you know, take a step backwards and rethink things and begin. So it's not sort of a, a straight sort of line upwards. Nonetheless, uh, the accumulation, uh, the ability to communicate through language, you can, of course, communicate without language too, a shrug and a grunt and a shrug of the shoulders and this kind of thing, but not nearly as much, not with as much detail and specificity. So uh, language is, is a huge takeoff uh, in the acquisition of knowledge, the ability to pass it on, the ability to learn from it and improve 
uh, things uh, from it uh, to bring about uh, necessary or uh, desired changes. The cave paintings. We saw a, a picture here or there at the beginning of the unit. Uh, here we see uh, some others. These are actually famous, uh, the most famous uh, cave art here. These coming from uh, places, sites in Spain and France from uh, tens of thousands of years ago. So not hundreds of thousands, but still uh, uh, pretty far back there. Uh, and uh, David Christian, who I quoted already, says, Paleolithic art, such as cave paintings, hints at a rich artistic and spiritual life. Uh, Paleolithic religions were probably based on the animistic assumption that the world contains many different types of living beings. There's been a great deal of scholarly literature on, on these uh, paintings and other aspects of uh, prehistorical art, uh, and, and there's a great deal of controversy about uh, why these things were, were, were done. Th these were actually painted actually pretty deep uh, in caves in France and Spain, and the, the fact that they were done so deep inside caves has caused some scholars to believe that they, these were done for religious purposes. There's something about being sort of that far into a cave that kind of evoked a spiritual sense of awe on nature, etc., or isolation, like monks going into monasteries. So it's, of course, possible, maybe even likely, that's part of it. And this could be also just self-expression uh, or, you know, expression of the, of the culture, uh, of the community. So uh, art for art's sake. It could also be instructions, uh, as has been pointed out by some as well. That's a possibility. That and look at the the one on the top, the drawing there, animals and guys with bows. It looks like, uh, sort of like an instructional uh, instructional manual. Uh, here's what they look like. Here are their footprints. Sometimes you actually see footprints sort of in the paintings next to them, uh, put there. Uh, here's what they look like, uh, and here's how to hunt them. So, uh, is it religion? Is it art for art's sake? Are these practical manuals or all of the above and more? Good question. I'm not going to answer it for you. It's still uh, open to debate. Hunter-gatherers uh, always uh, had values, value systems of uh, cooperation and sharing. That's not to say there was no competition. I think it's clear that uh, human beings uh, everywhere at all times have sort of been a combination of competitors uh, and sort of uh, you know, cooperators. Uh, but uh, I think the degree uh, to which it's one or the other uh, does uh, change some over time. Uh, Marvin Perry, uh, our beloved textbook author, says uh, that they learned how to plan, organize, cooperate, trust, and share. Hunters assisted one another in tracking and killing game, finding cooperative efforts more successful than individual forays. By sharing their kill and bringing some back to their camp for the rest of the group, they reinforced the social bond. So too did women who gathered nuts, seeds, and f uh, fruit for the group. Bands that did not cooperate in the hunt, uh, in food gathering, or in food distribution were unlikely to survive. So uh, cooperation uh, was the name of the game uh, if you wanted to survive uh, and or thrive. So your rugged individualist by nature uh, probably didn't do so well. Uh, you kind of your libertarian hunter-gatherer probably was in trouble. You know, screw you guys. I'm going to be out here on my own. Uh, I don't need to. You know, I don't need all this communist stuff going on here. Uh, I'm a capitalist. I'm going out on my own. Uh, well, good luck to him. But he's probably going to be lunch uh, for some, uh, you know, sort of wild, uh, large cat or something. Uh, you know, by the end of the day or later in the day. Um, Ian Morris, uh, uh, anthropologist at Stanford. Uh, an historian says that societies tend to get the thought they need, uh, which is a fancy way uh, of talking about what uh, an earlier historian more simply called challenge and response, a concept that isn't used that much any longer. Morris is using it here, so some scholars do, but not too much. But I like it. Uh, and so what this means is when societies, uh, groups of people, uh, you know, community, are faced with a challenge, especially an existential challenge. If they don't solve it, they're likely to, you know, perish. They usually come up with a solution because they're desperate. Uh, uh, and the main reason, of course, is that the more uh, the more necessary it is to solve the problem, the more resources, time, effort, energy, 
brain power, manpower, uh, uh, you know, uh, is going to be put into it. Uh, so that doesn't mean they're going to get a solution, but it makes it more likely that they will than, say, some other group uh, who doesn't need to solve the problem, the same problem, uh, as badly because they have other sources of food or it's not existential for whatever reason. They might come up with the, the solution first, whether it's a technological fix or whatever it might be, a plan, uh, but they're less likely to because they're not, as, they're not likely to put as much into it. So this is, the I think, the useful conceptual tool of societies tend to get the thought they need, meaning if they need thinking that solves the, uh, you know, how do we create something that becomes say, the bow and arrow uh, to be able to hunt a smaller, faster moving animals successfully? How do we do that? Uh, because we desperately need to, because uh, all we have to eat around here and they're too fast for spears. Uh, well, uh, societies tend to get the thought they need. So they sometimes don't. But if they don't, they tend to falter, stagnate, or totally collapse. So they tend to because, not because they're, it's wishful thinking, we want it to happen, we want it to happen, okay, there it is. No, because they put uh, more and more into it until they get the response they need. We're now going to look at a series of slides, four of them, uh, with this title uh, from a quote that says, The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there, which uh, was said a long time ago by a famous person. Uh, and uh, I could say this about any uh, uh, unit we're talking about in this class, since it's referring to the past in a general sense. Uh, but I use it here since it's the first unit. Uh, it's, it's a good uh, phrase to keep in mind. And I repeat it from slide to slide, partly because it'll hopefully uh, sort of sink in uh, uh, to you. So what, the, what does this mean? Uh, well, of course, when we go to visit a foreign country, uh, we know that the culture will be different, language will be different, the food will be different, their way of life will be different, their customs will be different uh, from place to place. We don't expect, well, usually anyway, to go somewhere else and for them to sort of be just like us. So the advice being given here uh, by uh, this, uh, uh, from this quote is saying when you go into the past uh, to sort of learn about uh, uh, someone, ancient Romans or uh, the uh, ancient uh, Chinese, uh, whoever it may be, you are, uh, uh, it's like going to another country. Uh, you can't expect them to live like you do today, to think and act like you do today, because it was a different place. Uh, so uh, this is a reminder that to understand uh, any time and place and group of people or person, even a single person in the past, uh, it's very useful as much as we can to make the mental effort as successfully as possible to put yourselves in their shoes uh, as sort of the cliched way of saying it goes. So that if you can sort of, okay, uh, what would people, you know, 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia uh, likely have been sort of thinking about this, uh, you know, that w the ways that we wouldn't uh, think today or, or things that they couldn't know that we know today and it would you know cause them to have a, a different set of responses and uh, you know uh, notions and feelings about it